right, so we are now. <laughs> I got it. We're recording live. Go ahead and do the intro song. Do we have an intro song? Do it. <laughs> okay, that was it. <laughs> hey, welcome to Brainwaves with Dr. Robin Barr. This is our second monthly webcast, um, meaning we made a webcast almost a month ago, <laughs> and this is our second one. Uh, we'll be heading into sort of a regular broadcast of this webcast um, every month. So. Welcome, Dr. Robin Barr. She's a linguist in residence at American University. She is a uh, dyslexia uh, interventionist, I guess, at, at the Washington the Literacy, Literacy Center, Center, and is I, teaching. I'm on loan to Washington English Center right now for a pilot course in uh, for low literacy English language learners. Right. So and I'm is... learning a whole lot. Wonderful. Yeah. Tell us what you're learning. I'm learning that I'm really, really bad at teaching low-level English learners. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> I have gone there and I've watched Robin teach, so I can verify that she's lying. Well, I uh, put it this way: I tend to talk too much. I keep thinking, don't that, we all? I, I keep thinking that if I explain it a different way, that will help. But in fact, what I need to do is explain it the same way, slower. Mm. I think the fact that you're noticing that already speaks volumes. Yeah. 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 Anything else you want to add about your time there? Oh, and that uh, this is going to be, uh, that this is my paper proposal for Watisol and Big Tisol is that you have to do the sounds before you do the letters. You can't do it the other way around. It does not work. So I think you're saying something against phonics? In, in a way. I, I'm <laughs> saying something against text-based beginning uh, uh, language learning. Would you say that, I, I'm really interested now in um, other phonics programs, would you say that by and large, maybe not by design, but by practice, that phonics programs take a letter grapheme based approach to teaching sounds? Is that Oh yeah, that's, that that's true? how it works. That's yeah. true. So I mean, that's, that's why I think for, um, for most purposes for learning to read uh, in your native language, um, well, English is kind of a special case, but uh, going both directions is probably the most helpful. So uh, in English, we're taught that the sound that uh, the lower case A makes is a, ah, like apple, mm -hmm. um, but that the, there's a short A and a long A. So there, the short A is a, ah, the long A is A, and there are all kinds of rules about what sound a given letter will make in a particular situation and uh, the more um, the more rules you have the more exceptions you get yeah so uh, and it eventually breaks down so that you uh, but that's okay because you've lost the student by then so you don't have to worry about the breaking well, down uh, what I <laughs> what I'm getting at here is that if, if it's in your native language yeah um, if you are able to do phonological analysis you can pretty much learn to read even with just that um, letter to sound based approach okay. because you are able to try decoding the words or sounding it out or tapping it out or however you're supposed to do it if you are if you have the ability in your brain to do um, phonological segmentation phonological analysis <clears throat> uh, which dyslexic kids don't or dyslexic adults don't uh, but if you are, you know, 75% of the native speaking children, you can pretty much learn to read in any uh, reasonable way, even just by memorizing sight words, you'll eventually figure out the patterns. Now, if you're learning a language that has a more regular alphabetic uh, letter to sound correspondence, then it's much simpler still because um, the letter A is ah, and it's always ah, and it's never anything else but ah, so it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right. and so you're fine. Um, if you are uh, learning to read in a language like French, which has a really, really uh, uh, distant relationship between the letters and the sounds, uh, but fairly regular, so uh, you will learn that this particular sequence of letters like E-A-U always sounds like O. Now, if you hear O, you don't know what letter it's going to come out as. It could be all kinds of things, and there are all kinds of dictations that you get if you're applying for a job that exploit that uh, that uh, gatekeeping yeah. uh, feature of the, the French language. But if you're learning to read in a language that's not your own, 
and that's that's where I'm uh, running into trouble with this pilot class. If you're going to read in a language that's not your own, you wind up possibly being able to sound out the words or tap out the words or however the symbol to sound correspondence works in English. But once you've done that, you don't know if you're right or not because you don't recognize the word. So what the important thing for uh, the programs that I'm working on is that you need to have a huge vocabulary of sound outable words before you could even start to do this kind of phonics uh, approach, the, um, or the Wilson approach, which is uh, the one I've been using, the dyslexia um, intervention uh, system. So you have to uh, front load all kinds of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have any words in jail? Oh, all, all the time. They're taboo words all the time that you, can't, yeah. that you cannot use because they have long vowels and we're not allowed to use long vowels. And the way the Wilson system does it, they say, okay, you can, you, you can teach them up to one sight word a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with the uh, uh, English language learners is that uh, they need more than one sight word a day because they don't know any of the words. Right. Yeah. So um, that, was, that was the biggest uh, discovery that I made. So what I did was all the words that I had in jail, in jail, um, I uh, classified according to the color vowel chart and yeah. that at least gave them a place to, to uh, keep them, different That's jail right. cells. Right. To put them in. Oh my God. <laughs> dun, da, da, dun. So if you are working with uh, that distinction between uh, rule followers and uh, rule breakers, uh, Really, you don't have to worry about that with a word wall that's color vowel based because every word has a place to go. And then you can still use something like Wilson or um, one phonics of the other or, phonics based yeah. programs. So, so anyway, that's, that's what I've been discovering. Great, great. Well, hey, we have a couple of great questions that have been raised in the past couple of weeks. I don't know what. Um, and I want to read a couple of comments before we get started. I'm going to be tutoring a low literacy refugee from Afghanistan or Iraq. That's raised by Jennifer. Um, so I'd be interested to hear more. All right. Well, well, we'll probably end up with this as a book end to our conversation today. Um, and there's another question like, but see. what you're saying is the exact opposite. This is what Jennifer said. It's the exact opposite of what the trainer said at the training uh, for the volunteers um, yesterday. So wow, I'd like to hear more about that. Yes. Yeah, so I think, uh, Jennifer, we need to have you dial in for a second here. Let's try this for just a moment. <laughs> okay, Jennifer, explain. <laughs> yeah, let's take you in. And, and if you don't mind um, bringing your video in, that would be great too. Oh, you don't want a video. <laughs> okay. okay let's come talk to us. So what, in, in brief, what happened yesterday? What was the message? Oh, well, um, Dr. Bard, this is the, um, the refugee um, aid organization that you posted about yes, yes. helping the um, families of translators for they were they were translators for the military and now they've come over as refugees and this is the one that emily vanderbain posted about right yes yeah. yes and so um they uh they're still trying to get themselves together and they had a notice the quotes training it was one hour and of a whole room of like 20 to 30 uh, volunteers, and some of whom were like me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. And um, who have experience, but most of them are just, you know, e people who are eager to help. And the um, person who was training us uh, was talking, um, she's a professor at another university, which I won't mention. Um, and um, she was suggesting that phonics is a great thing to do um, because that would help them learn the sounds. And she gave an example of the long A and short A, but then she used two different short A's. She used A and A in the two example words. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what were the words? I'm just curious. Uh, and there was apple, and then there was uh, oh, what's the oh. other one. It was an ah, uh, something that began with ah, uh, not Australia, but um, I can't remember what it is right now. And um, 
And then one of the very helpful people in the audience said, oh, well, you know, we should just do translation because, you know, I speak, I speak Pashto and this, the other language and I can just prepare materials so that they can do translation. And I, I was biting my tongue the whole time. So. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> so they, they need. That's really interesting. Help. And I would love to use that as a straw man in my paper. <laughs> Well, and I think as far as your, your own practical context goes, I think maybe um, since you happen to have an inside um, track with Dr. Barr is to invite her to the next volunteer uh, meeting. Yes, I told them, have you, I told one of the coordinators since I left, I said, have you heard of the color gal chart? Because I think you guys would really, you know, do a service if you did a training in that. So well, I dropped that bug in their ear. <laughs> I think we should go Shirley. I do too. By the way, I want to just make sure we know who's in the room today. We've got Shirley. Um, all three of us should be sitting here. You want to plop yourself right no, here in the middle? She, she keeps saying she's on her way out, but she doesn't I go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're at Shirley's house today because it's just so peaceful here and clean. Um, compared to, compared our to houses. Our yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Shirley's over here. Let's just say hi. Shirley. Hi. There she is. Hi, Shirley. Yeah. Surely. Yeah, she's always in uniform. Um, <laughs> great. Well, thanks, Jennifer, for, for telling us about that. And uh, really, let's do a little follow up and see what we can do, because we are trying to change the way people talk about English and bridging written English with spoken English and vice versa. Um, great. Well, I'm going to jump in. That's with really it. exciting. Isn't it? It's very exciting. I, 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 I'm uh, grabbed by uh, what was what I was thinking of as I was rushing over here. Do you want to explain why I was rushing over here? She's rushing over here because I sent her to my house instead of Shirley's for this little session. Um, <laughs> but, but, it, but at least but when I'm concentrating very hard on not crashing into anything as I'm speeding down the roads through Tacoma Park, my, my brain uh, seems to do work extra hard on coming up with things on language in, in the back of my head. So I was just, I was thinking that uh, this whole business of rules versus uh, things with exceptions that sort of have patterns but don't quite. That's exactly how uh, regular and irregular uh, morphology works, which mm -hmm. is, of course, what my thesis is about. That's right. And <laughs> of course, yes, I know that. Yes. And and of course, you know, I could go on for 600 pages at this point, but I'm thinking that possibly the brain is processing them the same way. So we have uh, for the regular. Uh, spellings and phonology and so forth. We have all these uh, internal rules that are in Broca's area that are uh, not conscious, mm -hmm. that, that we're really not aware of and we're not aware, we're only aware when somebody violates the rule. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have a whole lot of, uh, I don't want to call them, maybe, maybe call them minor rules, semi-rules, patterns, but not rules, things that are not completely regular, but they are regular enough to be um, subconsciously absorbed and to be, if, if you're flooded with them, for example, a whole bunch of irregular verbs, if you take all the irregular verbs with a uh, mm -hmm. in the past tense. So you have strong, uh, sung, slunk, um, stunk. And as uh, my son says, brung. Exactly. Why, why would anybody create a new irregular verb unless there was a reason for it? I, I, I think of it as, um, Actually, I, th I think of it as uh, criminal. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, so my son's a criminal now? No, no, I, no the verbs, the <laughs> irregular verbs are like people who break the law okay. because there are all kinds of disincentives to break the law, right? In the larger society, right? Okay. Right. So you have punishments, uh, you have fines, you have prison, you right. have- Why uh, can't everybody just follow the rules? Yeah, why can't everybody just follow the rules, right? So why can't all these verbs just follow the darn rules? Yeah, bringed. Bringed, yeah. So why would an irregular verb like brought ever want to join a different gang like the right, if it's gonna change, change gangs, it should go to the good, right? Right, it just become yeah. Bringed. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't. It goes to another brung or brang, an <laughs> another brang. Yeah. yeah. So, so why should that happen? And this is what my dissertation was about: was there, there has to be some kind of reason in the brain why, at least locally, there is a preference for joining this irregular class instead of going over to the regulars who are too far away or or, or don't they're match just, like, close so enough. They're just like so preppy too. Like I don't like the way they dress, and they think they're still like better than everybody. <laughs> they do. They're just obnoxious, you know. <laughs> Uh, and the reason they're obnoxious is they're not ordinarily memorized. Uh -huh. They're not in your They're brain. not as available, right? They're not there. They're not there. Yeah. 
You just there's say, no okay, there, there. You ordinarily, you because you, you, you don't have to. It's a, it's a yeah. rule already. Yeah. You don't have to memorize it. It's in it's a right. rule, so you can you can delete all those uh, extra things from your lexicon. And here, in, in all seriousness, whenever I run the uh, the, the past tense ed exercise, where mm. we um, in, you know, we inductively figure out the, the rule for whether it's going to be a, um, a d, a t, or an id and I, and I love that. I use it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that, are you implying that you learned it from me? I did. Really? I did. In fact, yes, I did. Years ago. Jennifer can right. uh, attest that I use it in principles now. Ah, well, I'm glad to know Before that. Before we do the one test. Because I don't, yeah, wonderful. Well, um, when I do that, you know, the big challenge of it is, is if you say, oh, um, Give me a verb. Um, the first verb they give you is an irregular verb. Yeah. And so is the second. And, and all, so is the third. Yeah. And so when I run that activity, what I do instead is we stand in a circle and I just focus on, on reality. And I say, what did you do this weekend? And they start telling me, and I, I don't have anything on the board. And we just, I just make a list. I know what the list is, but all the irregulars go over there. And they, and do, each they time, do on my board, too, because I learned it from you. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> and then that way, you know, because they can't think of the regular verbs until they say, and I walked to, you know, I took a walk and I, oh, so you walked. Yeah, I walked. Mm -hmm. And I stick it up there because they simply can't, there is no there there. Yes, they can't you, you can, you can pull up all kinds of past tenses that are irregular. It's yeah. very difficult to come up with an example of a, of a regular past tense. There you go. Because it's not there. You don't have to, you don't have to remember it. I mean, it, that's why it's simpler, yeah. right? Yeah, we don't It costs less it. in general to your brain. Yeah. But there is also some kind of cost savings by joining one of these irregular gangs. And that's what I was trying to work out. The cool factor, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there, there the, well, I call it salience, but you could yeah. call it coolness. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right? brain coolness. Yeah, brain cool. Yeah. So, I, and I just had the idea on the way over here that um, – Spelling irregularities work the same way. So if we could flood um, spelling the way we flood irregular verbs, mm -hmm. that might make that might help a whole lot. So instead of having to, huh. yeah. So think about that. Yeah, Laura McAdoo, start thinking about that. We'll come yeah. back and figure out what that means. Yeah. No. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, ra rather than learning it by by okay, this is the pattern a consonant e. You memorize that pattern, and here's another pattern. Uh, and when two vowels go off and the first one goes, it does the talking, except for this, 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 and this, yeah. you know, uh, instead of doing that, maybe just flooding with the vowel pattern will work better. And I think you can use your spelling exploration worksheet for that. So think That's about right. that. Great. Great. Well, Hey, um, in my color vowel community, we had, um, a nice question earlier this week about Caribbean and Caribbean. Yeah. Um, which one's right? Aha! Yes. What do you think? Oh, you know. Which I, one do you say? I uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean. Or Pirates of the Caribbean. I think as a child, I went through the ride and it was the Pirates of the Caribbean. Hmm. But then I actually lived in, did you know I lived in Trinidad and Tobago? Oh, cool. As a child. And that was the Caribbean. And that was where the pirates were. That, yeah. well, the Caribbean is where the pirates are. But the Caribbean, the Caribbean is where, where, you <laughs> where the island is. Yeah. 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 So, what about when you have an ad, when Caribbean is used as an adjective before a noun? So the Caribbean Sea. Or the Caribbean Sea or the Caribbean Sea? The Caribbean Sea. The Caribbean Sea. The, the Carib Caribbean Sea. But I'm going on a cruise in the Caribbean Sea. Caribbean. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I have another example for you yeah. that might be easier than um, Caribbean. What about um, a word like 13? How do you uh, explain to your students the difference 13. between 13 and 30? <laughs> okay, how do we say the difference between 13 and 30? Um, uh, did I, you hear what you just did? 13 and 30. Yes, you yeah, did. The flat, to me, but is no, the major but, but I said 13. And yeah. you said 13 and 30. Right. And I said 13. Yeah. Where is the stress? Yes. I would say yes to that. The stress is wherever you, the stress is wherever you want it to be. To me, the big when I I talk about how thirteen or whether it's thirteen or thirteen, the important thing is that it, it has an aspirated t in the middle, hmm. whereas thirty yeah. flaps the t. Okay. What do you think of that? Because the t ending in uh, American English is always unstressed, and therefore you can flap the t. Like 20, 30, 40, 50, mm -hmm. 60, 60, 70, 80, 90. Okay. Mm -hmm. But 13 
13, 13, 14, 14, 15, 16, 16, it's hard to tell because you've got the S in, in front of it, right, 17, 18, 19, 20. So if we say counting, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 17, 17, it 17. starts getting very strange. Yeah. So, yeah, so the difference between a real T and a flap T is going to be enough unless you're a student in a class that has a teacher who says 30, right. 70. Right. Yeah. Uh, what you see in most of the textbooks is the difference between uh, 30 and 13 is where the stress is. So right. you say um, 30 is purple and yeah. 13 is green. Yeah. Okay. The problem with that is uh, as soon as the teacher starts counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, right. nineteen, twenty. It's contrast of stress. It's listing in contrast of stress. Okay. <laughs> or it's I guess to look, say, so I elaborate. I say, how old are you? I'm thirteen. 13. I'm, I'm, I'm thirteen. How old are you? I'm thirteen years old. Exactly. Right. Da 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 da. Or uh, 15 men on a dead man's chest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. If we're doing Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. or Caribbean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 15 men, okay. Or how about when you do that um, state sorting task? Mm -hmm. What do you do with um, Illinois, right, and Tennessee? Yeah. Uh, ordinarily, we say, oh, those have final stress. Illinois, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee. So turquoise, toy, Illinois. Illinois. Green tea, Tennessee. Tennessee. Okay. And, and then, then somebody says, well, what about Tennessee? Tennessee legislature. Right. Tennessee walking horse. Tennessee walking horse. Uh, so all of this, how does this connect with the Caribbean and ah, Caribbean? Because English has a rule or tendency or preference. A behavior. A <laughs> you don't like. Yeah, she doesn't like anthropomorphized I, language. Well, I'm, no, no, no spoken, I'm not a behaviorist. Just, That's there we my go. problem. Okay. Yeah. So um, English has a brain thing uh, that it doesn't like. English does not like uh, two stressed syllables in a row. Right. So uh, English, uh, if you if you add up the um, I think Litterman and Prince back in the was it 80s first came up with this. Uh, you have alternating stress, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, and then you have uh, words, uh, syllable stress, and then you have word stress, which does, adds another layer of strong, weak, strong, weak. Mm -hmm. And then you have sentence stress, yep. which adds another layer of weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. And you add up how many strongs you've got. And if you have two adjacent things that are both strong, like one's a four and one's a five, uh, like 13 men, yeah, they're going to can't do that. Yeah, yeah. they're going to fight. They're, you're not going to be able to do you it. you got 13 men. So and dead how do you explain that to your students? How do you explain stress shift to your students? How do you explain stress shift uh, to your and students? And English isn't the worst one. Uh, German and Dutch, I think, I, uh, and I think Frisian do it even more, I've, I've yeah. heard. I don't well, know a couple of comments here uh, from Laura. She says, I think <laughs> the answer to your question, according to Laura, is, is similar to mine, which is I don't explain that. I just say that the T is the most helpful advice for 13. <laughs> well, what color are they? Where do you put them in the vowel chart? Because that's right. where we wind up having trouble. I had, I, I had 13, and we put it in green, and I said 13. And they said, now what do we do? It's and purple the, now. Right, and the test is, you know, when we, we say, say, how old are you? I'm 13. You know, that's weird. I'm 13. I'm 13. Ooh, you know, I'm 13. Yeah. So, so, so we, we kind of want to talk about whether it's the end of a phrase or in the, uh, before another word. So this is where uh, syntax winds up intersecting with morphology and with uh, uh, phonology and stress. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, like I said, you have sentence stress uh, weighing in, literally, uh, on the final uh, content word of the utterance. So if, uh, for example, inside, mm -hmm. uh, let's go inside, right? Yeah, she's in, yeah, let's go inside. Let's go inside. <laughs> but if I said, um, uh, he's the inside man. Right. Or I have uh, uh, inside, inside information. information. Yeah. So suddenly I have to switch yeah. from inside to inside. <clears throat> and the same thing happens with particle shift. Mm -hmm. So. I have to pick up my daughter. I have to pick my daughter up. 
So when it's at the end of the end of the sentence, yeah. suddenly this unstressed particle that's just a little tiny uh, function word winds up getting stressed because now it's at the end of the sentence and it gets the yeah. sentence stress. And then that's the pickup point. Pick up. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, I have to pick up my daughter. I think, I think log in yeah. rather than trying to explain, I mean, there's something in here. We have to say words are not, this is sort of Laura's point here too, that, that talking about the word alone is going to get us in trouble, that there's no one right um, answer. We can talk about a default, right? But then, then all kinds of things happen when words get into context. And it's scary. <laughs> and that, and that's why I yeah. think chunks are, are going to be more helpful. Yeah. So we, we were singing the, uh, I taught them the happy birthday song. I taught the students, uh, you know, happy birthday to you. And then we go into the second verse. How old are you? And then you don't know what to do. I've, I've, I didn't know there was I've, a second verse. I've never. <laughs> how old are you? How old are you? Oh, I don't like that old with two notes. That's, that's disturbing you? to oh, me. Oh, but it's, you know, how old, how are, old you? are you? How old are you? How old are you? How old are you? <laughs> how old are you? Oh, wow. So, but then you wind up with, I'm 13 years old. And so, no, I'm 13 years old. I'm, yeah. What do I do? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that's when we. I think I'll go back to not knowing the second verse. <laughs> and then, then it's of trouble. course, there's, um, you look like a monkey. That one I know. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a nice one. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, so so can I pull out the term iambic reversal? Yes. Yeah. Have I not mentioned that? No. Oh, okay. But so I, iambic and, reversal. And I, I am is um, Shakespeare iambic pentameter. Da 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 da. da. So uh, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, and yeah. that's um, that's if you have weak, strong, strong, weak, then you have to flip it because yeah. your brain or your language or the English language. Uh, doesn't like to do that. Yeah. It has too many uh, long syllables next to one another. Now, if English were a syllable time language, so all you had to do was go da 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 da, you probably could get away with da 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 da. It could yeah. it could uh, it could work. Spanish, um, I think, allows for that. Does Spanish allow uh, two stressed syllables in a row? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. All right. So, does this also explain um, the, the, our spidery question about the brown recluse and the recluse that uh, Evelyn raised? Yes, it, it does. Was, I heard. It's funny if Evelyn gets to hear this. I heard that NPR report where they were talking about the the brown, and then she said the brown recluse. And and so not only was it you know with stress in the second syllable, it was with a z yeah. instead of a s recluse. The brown recluse, and and I thought. I think that's a performance error. Yeah. I, I really, you know, she was thinking reclusive and then she caught herself. Ah, reclusive. What do you think? I think uh, this is also left over from the stress shift of nouns back when English was borrowing all these Latinate words. Uh, so you, you, do you know, uh, typically when you borrow um, a Latin stem, like um, oh, uh, import, right? When it's the verb, it's import because the Latin word uh, was importare. It had an, another syllable on the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the stress stayed on the second syllable for longer, import for the mm -hmm. verb. Okay? okay. For the noun import, uh, it had, uh, it didn't have as many syllables on the end. So uh, importus or something like that. And that allowed uh, English to shift the stress to the first syllable, which English likes to do. Uh, Old English had a rule that everything but um, preverbs, uh, you know, function particles, uh, would be stressed on the initial syllable. Okay. And that's how that's how Beowulf works, and that's how Icelandic still works, yeah. apparently. But uh, when French came in uh, and Latin words came in, it messed up the whole stress system, which is one reason why English stress is not predictable. But we still have patterns. Again, here we have the lexical patterns. So we have uh, import, the verb, but import, mm -hmm. the noun. Uh, produce, but produce. Mm -hmm. right? So I think in this case, uh, recluse would feel more like a verb or an adjective reclu uh, reclusive, like you said, uh -huh. but uh, a recluse, that would be somebody who is reclused, I suppose. Okay. Um, and uh, so recluse would, what are we? Nothing. Oh, okay. Uh, re recluse uh, has the initial stress. So uh, 
can you say a brown recluse? Is, this person is a recluse. I think you could. I think you could. I, th I, I have a could. feeling that you could. I just don't but, think I think I do. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, recluse arises because of that uh, noun pattern of initial stress also. Yeah. So this comes, I think this will be coming up a lot with anything involving color vowels, right? Because students you have, you have will have heard one way or the other mm -hmm. word, the recluse, the red dress recluse, or the blue moon recluse, and you're there to figure out, well, I think this feels more natural to me to say the recluse, but I suppose I, I don't want to discount their reality that they heard somebody say recluse because it was on NPR, and that makes it reality. Um, so you and, may end up kind and, of putting it over here for a little bit and, and then moving it over. And you have different dialects uh, do it. So people who say insurance instead of insurance. Right. People say umbrella instead of umbrella. Yeah. Uh, the TV. British, TV. The people who say garage, like the British, instead yeah. of garage. Uh-huh. Okay. And so the Brits. Let's talk about the Brits for a moment. Oh, yes? Yes. Um, so I'm always curious. I, I've, I don't know. It sticks out to me when I listen to British people talking about ideas. Because um, I end up saying something like, the idea of it. And, and I'm always, I come back to this question, and, and we, we've talked about this a lot. And then Robin explains it, and then it, it, fill, it, it sort of just dissipates, and I can't grasp. Um, it's a conspiracy. It's, it's a conspiracy? It's a conspiracy. Okay, I thought you just said. Conspir well, no, wow. Maybe I, okay, conspiracy. Probably. Well, my question is, when I notice something like the idea of it, um, in a British uh, bit of discourse there, I, I then get so excited because here's, you know, R right at the top of the color vowel chart. Um, we know really well what Y and W do beyond being the destination for glides and diphthongs. Um, that you might have, you know, rose goes to O and to W and, and gray, A goes up to A, y, y, it goes up to the Y. Um, but we don't have any vowels here other than, than the, the very handy orange that we use sometimes, some of us, um, that goes to R. So, so then I put, you know, R's up there because purple's up there, I get that. But I was thinking it's not really used in linking vowels to vowels in except, American English, except, except in British English it does. So yeah. can you tell me what's going on there? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> I'm so excited. All right. So uh, going back to linking, um, notice that the vowels are that link are the moving vowels. So uh, if you had C, you would link see it. So mm -hmm. you, you go up to the, the y and then back down again, see it. Um, uh, say, uh, say it. There's an invisible Y in there. Um, uh, do it. So uh, you would link to W because ooh has a, has a W in there. You don't ordinarily notice it, but it's there when you link. Um, uh, uh, know it. Um, no, wo, wo, no, know it, it. know yeah. it. Um, what's a good one? Uh, why? Uh, 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 that toy is really that toy is that yeah. toy is awesome. Yeah. So, so that's not an invisible why. That's actually you can see it there. But um, uh, we have the uh, the moving vowels oi, o, u, a, e. We still have i, yeah. i. So buy it and. Uh, Ow, uh, plow it. Plow it. <laughs> plow the plow it. Yeah. So we have all of these, uh, the ones that are written with W's and Y's are easier to acknowledge. But for all of these tense vowels, the E, A, U, and O, we uh, also insert, or we don't insert, we, it, it, we reveal the, uh, the glide, the Y, or the W that is inherent in that phoneme A and E. Uh, now, why don't the other ones link with Y and W? I heard... Um, yeah, that idea is... Okay, that I, 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 before, oh. I, before you get to... I, I know you want to get to idea. I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, I don't, I, even know how to, I don't even know what color idea is. I just want to say that publicly. Uh, <laughs> We've talked about mustard. this, Laura. Mustard. So... Um, why don't we, uh, I, I've heard, I, and I've seen in textbooks, oh, if, if, you have a, if you have a front vowel, you link with a Y, and if you have a back vowel, you link with a W, and they think that solves it, right? That's so not What true. does that mean? Well, it, if, if your word ends with a front vowel, 
E A A A, you link with a Y. Yikes. If you uh if your um if your word ends with a back vowel, ooh, uh, oh, uh, and leave that out, ah, ah, you link with a W. And that is demonstrably not true, but there's a, a, another reason why it's, it's stupid. <laughs> you know? Because um, if you think about it, okay, so what words in English end with I? Zero. Yeah, there aren't any. What words in English end with U? Anybody have any ideas? Uh, no, no. There is no word in English that ends with uh. None. Okay. Um, what's a word in English, um, here I have to be more specific, a word in English that ends with eh that's not an excla exclamation. So it would say meh or yeah, bleh. Yeah. Right. Not, that not that has a bit of a yeah. So something that's not that, but an actual lexical item. Eh. Yeah, yeah, nothing. Nothing. Okay. So uh, how about a word that ends with eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're all. These are all kinds of um, phonus uh, themes of some kind. Yeah, yeah. So, some kind of interjection or or uh, uh, a nonverbal word. No, that doesn't make sense. Non-lexical word. Non-lexical word. word. Yeah. So, so I mean, yes, it's it's conventionalized, but it's yeah. still. Uh, so we can say word. the same for any of these that are non. So the ones that have the Ys, which are the same ones that you've just described, or the Ws, right? So anything that has these little watermark guys. We've marked precisely because they're moving. Yeah. And the ones without any of these watermarks do not move. Right. And don't link, don't use the linking rule of why. Exactly. Exactly. Because so, they're not, you don't, you don't need. Ordinarily. Well, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, if it's a, it's a front vowel, it links with a Y because. And who says that again? Oh, I've seen it in lots of, the, lots of uh, pronunciation okay. books. I, I'll, I'll find an example for you. Okay. I, I use this sometimes in my um, classes. Is like, what is what's wrong with this textbook? <laughs> yes. Um, but these are the ones that uh, are front vowels. They don't link that way because you never find them at the end of a word. Uh, these are the ones that are back vowels that don't link that way, including olive sock, which is really a back vowel. Jennifer, it's a back vowel. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when you actually look at the uh, the words. It is possible to end an English word with C cup of mustard, with a, uh, or with ah, uh, olive, or with aw, uh, auburn. So uh, if, since these are back vowels, what would you predict according to that uh, rule? You should, uh, you should link with a W if it's a back vowel. So if I have law and order, it should turn into law when order. Law when order. Does it? No. No. Law and order. Law and order. Is there a, is there a what in there? No. Uh, what about spa? The, the spa is... The spa around this the is, corner. Yeah, this gets into what okay. I really care about. So that's what you care about. Now, uh, what I love about uh, New England English and uh, British English is that they have solved this problem because English hates having two vowels in a row. English, you know, uh, you have to insert a glottal stop. So the, the spa is or law and, law, order. Law and order. If you have, if you have two, um, two vowels in a row, that's often what you wind up doing. That's why you have like um, the versus the. Uh -huh. So if you say, um, what's a, uh, the apple, the apple right. is the prescriptive version is a the apple. Okay. If you have, nobody says, the apple. The apple. The apple. Or at least, uh, sorry, nobody in um, uh, North American English says the apple. There, I think some dialects of English, uh, British English do it. But uh, you have to say either the apple or the, the apple. apple. Okay, so you either have to link or you have to put in a glottal stop. But these are a problem. Mustard, olive, and auburn. So what happened is that because there are enough words in uh, British English that drop their R's before a consonant or word boundary, like far, fa, right? like um, uh, for, full, full. Uh, like um, doctor, doctor, doctor. Sorry, yes, doctor. So, so anything that ends with <laughs> I'm not ER, correcting your yeah, British yeah, accent. I but, promise uh, you. So uh, anything that ends with ER is going to uh, sound doctor. like schwa. Anything that ends with OR might sound like. Uh, Auburn dog, anything that is with AR, like car, would, would car. come out as car. Okay, so um, 
if you grow up hearing alternations, uh, um, park your po sorry, park your car, but park your car rin havid yard. That R comes and goes depending on whether there's a vowel after it or not. You could uh, do in your head something called rule inversion, which is instead of uh, having the form be car and then deleting the R before a consonant. Uh, instead, you have the word ka and you insert uh, an R before a vowel. Yep. Once you turn it into R insertion, I mean, that, that's what we do, have, do right now with our A an. So we had, instead of, it, it was originally an, which was the, the form, a short form of the word one, right? Um, so an apple was one apple. But now we think of A as the base form and we insert an N before a vowel instead of thinking of an as the base form and we just delete the n before a consonant. Yeah, we think of a as, as the an, unmarked. As the unmarked case. And yeah. an as the marked case. Right, so we're, we're inserting this, this random consonant before a vowel. Yeah. I mean, why would, why would you do that? Well, that's what the British are doing when they have a word that ends in an uh or an ah uh or an all. Uh, and they will say something like law and order. Yeah. Law and order, or the sp uh, in, Eng in uh, New England, a spa is a corner store. So the spa, the spa around the corner, the spa around the corner. A spa is a, is a store? Yeah, okay. a spa is, is, a, is a corner store, like, you know, like, like a 7 Eleven. Yeah. Okay. The spa around the corner. Uh, sorry, corner. Corner. Uh, um, and uh, 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 Cuba in America. Mm -hmm. So that, would, that was the. Uh, uh, that was what people made fun of President Kennedy for saying Cuba in America instead of Cuba in oh, okay. America. So now I'm just going to, I'm going to take this over to, I sort of feel funny talking without saying hi. Um, so what about Southern? Somebody Who's, left. Yeah, Laura had to go. Bye, Laura. Um, so Southern. So someone says, why? Why? And then they say, why are you here? Are they going to pull out the, the glide and hit the Y connection for why are? Why are you if they say why, why, they normally why. say why. I don't know why. I don't know why. But then if it's why are you, why, 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 why are you here? Are they going to come up and borrow the why? I don't know. what uh, uh, You have why, had why? enough experience with Southern dialects to know. Because uh, one interesting thing about Southern dialects is they have R drop, but they don't have R insertion. Okay. So uh, okay. Southern English might drop the R, but won't stick it back in. Why are you uh, here? Why are you here? Why? Why? I don't First, know why. Why are you here? I why, think so. You, I think you skip. I think you, 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 you take it out. Um, you, like you said, put it back in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but one of the interesting things about uh, both Boston English and Southern English is that you wind up changing, changing your ah as in car. You, you uh, take out the R, but you front the ah to show that there, the used, to, there used to be an, ah, an R there. So the ka as opposed to uh, the ka, I don't know what a ka would be, but uh, uh, that's why people would say, oh, you, you come from Boston. Well, for somebody from, who was actually from Boston, Boston would be B-A-R-S-T-O-N, uh, Boston. Yeah. And Boston is back here, Boston. Boston, yeah. Boston. Because Boston, that is a weird vowel, but it's not ah, it's, right. it's uh, A-R. Yeah, which is precise. I mean, I think that's why it's so hard to um, imitate, you know, an accent that's not yours. Because yeah, you, you don't know what the rules are. You don't know what the deep rules are. Yeah. You just sort of over apply everything. And, I, and I told you the joke about uh, they came from afar and they came from afar. Right. Last week. It's the same thing. So if you're uh, deleting the Y uh, in fire or in Y, uh, you still get movement of the A uh, to the mm -hmm. front. So you know the Y used to be there. Yeah. So, so a while back, we started coming up with questions about what to do about British English with the color voucher. Oh, yeah. And I just thought, you know, we'd finish up our session. We have a couple of minutes um, showing you, you know, we have this thing. It's a prototype of the British color voucher chart. Did you know? Uh, we've had it around for, uh, gosh, over five years. And I do have a couple of people um, using it. The problem is coming the up with the, uh, the words, because not all dialects of British English agree. And you know more what? than diets of American English. Exactly. I mean, I think we can, we, we, if we dig deep, and, and it's not really in our self-interest, but we could dig deep and find, uh, for example, people who really don't feel like pin is silver. 
Um, we've come across that. And so it, it isn't as easy to um, poke holes in the American color valve chart as it is what I'm about to show you. But what we've come up with seems to be working for the, the clients that I have. And I'm going to do a share screen function here. Um, so here it is, share screen. All right, so you should all be seeing the um, now the British version of the color valve chart. And this is the wonky stuff down here is the um, sort of, you see it pieced together. Prototype just means I took PowerPoint and messed with the image. Um, Laura's gonna do her beautiful work someday and make this uh, visually elegant. And you wanna move, um, you probably wanna move them back. So. Yeah, I wanna move them back to the right possibly. Yeah. This is the kind of stuff that, that Robin and Shirley and I discuss in great depth about lines and where things sit. Um, but I guess what I wanna show is how I, I'm fascinated by this. Um, so the word Auburn, which for me has always been olive because I'm from a, a back merger dialect of English. Um, Auburn goes into the far back region of the yeah. vocal tract. It's just below O. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the lax version of O, which you see in all the phonetics handbooks uh, for uh, backwards, backwards, um, C, backwards C, yeah. uh, but American English doesn't really have that. It's a oh. Yeah. Oh. So what's going to happen is we take, uh, I think a, we can take olive. Um, olive in American English is olive, and well, then it becomes olive. 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 Which is which our is more, Auburn. <laughs> yeah. And our Auburn, our Auburn becomes Auburn. So that you have now you have a space here because Olive moved to Auburn and Auburn moved to real Auburn. But we, but we don't have a space because we, we still have father. And then we have the word father. And, and what do you do with father? Father's Olive, right? Well, for us. Right. Yeah. And but you need, you need a word for father in British English because Olive right. isn't going to work. Right. Yeah. And so, um, but essentially these two colors still remain quite good. The word dog is a problem. It, so we've changed that to fawn. Auburn fawn, which is that little baby deer, right? Auburn fawn is back here. Olive sock works pretty well. Olive, I, olive sock. Olive yeah. sock. Yeah. And then here in the middle, I'll go back to sharing that screen one more time for Jennifer and Sam. Um, so here we go. We have talked with Sin Hatch and some other folks that you all know. Um, and so there's tomato cot. Tomato cot, and that's where father goes yeah. also. The problem with this is that there is an R there. Yeah, that's what I'm always wondering, tomato cot. And that's fine if you are from the R, people who drop their R's. Uh -huh. uh, but if you're from a dialect that does not drop the R's, tomato, I guess it, it could still be a uh, tomato cart. 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 Mm -hmm. like, yeah. a, like what, a Scottish? Scottish? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, I've also encountered some British speakers who say tomato, uh, or no, sorry, tom tomato. Tomato. Yeah. So it's not always ah. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, so, so that's kind of where we are with yeah. the, the, the British. All I can say is I, I have it with two or three clients in the UK, and they're happy to have this move and this extra, well, it's funny because it's not an extra on the front side, it's an extra on the back side, phonologically oh, speaking. But then you've got the dialects that take a lot of the cup of mustard words and turn them into wooden, wooden words. Right. So Can you give us an example? Just, uh, a cup, a cup a of cup, mustard. A cup, <laughs> a cup of mustard. A cup of mustard. Yeah. yeah. And so any, any, anything yeah. north of, uh, anything uh, in Northumbria or, or uh, further north than that is going to be. A cup so of a, couple, a couple of questions here. Uh, yes. um, let's see. So exciting. Are you so excited, Jennifer? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Nice cup of tea. <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, so it is exciting. Um, on that same note, I've got, I, I stay in touch with a, a tutor teacher, American, who goes to China on a regular basis and teaches with, oh gosh, British and Irish uh, teachers, English teachers there. And he took the color valve chart with him. Um, yep. And you know, they just, past a certain point, they just found it useful the way it is, the North American version, and just don't make as much of an issue. Sin it, uses it. Yeah, Sin and, uses it, she's yeah. Australian. Um, the question comes down to how flexible, I suppose, is the person, and somebody who's teaching abroad outside of their own English-speaking country might be more flexible about those things. Well, one of the things I've really noticed, and this, this has come up when we were talking about the, um, the, the cell phone app, mm -hmm. is that, 
it's the teachers who object yes. the most to having the, the chart not be exactly their own dialect. And what do I do? And, and right. well, it, it's this one for you, but it's this other one for me. And, and what, what do we tell their students? And the students actually, they don't seem to be bothered by it. They're not bothered. Very much. Very much. They're not bothered when they're told, you know, these two are touching. It really isn't a problem whether you say egg or egg. Um, it's, it's, the tr it's true. It, the yeah. time it takes to train teachers to not worry about it is much more intensive than letting a student know that, that when they touch, it can be um, either. A so, I mean, time. is it red dress hair? Well, maybe. You know, is it gray day hair? hair maybe. maybe. It's something in between the two? Maybe. Sure. Yeah. But hair, uh, hair, hair. that definitely uh, pings wrong to the native speakers. He said, I, I, I don't like saying red dress hair because it really doesn't match for me. And it, and it, yeah. true, it doesn't match because yeah. the hair doesn't have the, the diphthong in it. Right. Yeah. And if or it hair does, hair. a hair, yeah. it's kind of conspicuous to someone not from that dialect. Um, Jennifer says, that reminds me of the issue we talked about in my cultural issues class. They said, if English is a global or international language, then what is the model? Yeah. And you know, there's, so we're, right now, you know, we're, we're creating an app um, and it's, it's a fascinating process. We've had to make certain kinds of decisions to, to have the student in mind. So until now, the, the chart has really been this wonderful tool for connecting teachers to other teachers and to their students. And so I've had teachers who, uh, prior to the workshop, we're ridiculing that one teacher for speaking funny and that teacher um, calling themselves, you know, sort of, well, I speak kind of broken English, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, and, and with the chart, they're able to say, you know, I am actually a valid speaker of English and I use some different colors than my colleagues. And so they have this way to talk about it. Um, but now with the app, we're creating this, this game that's going to be just for a speaker of English, a learner of English. And so we've, we've made some decisions and one of them has been hard. It's been that we're not going to have Auburn in it. And so that's a hard decision, but, um, and one that has not come easily, nor does it remain um, settled. <laughs> but it's the, the question I kind of raise, and, and my bias is implicit in all of this. Um, if I've never needed Auburn to survive, then could I argue that, that learners of English also don't need Auburn? to be effective speakers of English. Ah, but then that, what that means is that you're privileging your dialect, which likes orange, but doesn't need Auburn. Right. But it's you can, hard. You can get because orange. you can't get into that whole discussion in, for that matter, in the app, whether it's egg or egg, we, we can't have two answers when you're talking about an app that is for a user with a computer. Uh, it needs to be much more um, one answer without without being prescriptive. And that's my goal, I think, is yeah. that it's going to have one answer, but it's not going to say this is the one right way. Um, and we're going to try to support it with the notion that there are many good ways to speak. So we're, we're training this thing to listen to a variety of accents. It yeah. will allow you to use Auburn and still be right. Um, or egg and still be right. Exactly. Yeah. So we're trying to train this machine to hear uh, a red dress egg and red dress egg and to allow both. That's what's exciting. So we will see where that goes. Um, and so Jennifer, thank you so much to Jennifer and Sam for joining us today and Laura too. Um, again, it, since we really are just the, the three and the four and the five of us here, um, this is the second one of these webcasts. If you have thoughts about ways that we can make this, um, we're not ready yet to kind of, I don't, I'm not pushing it big in terms of publicity <laughs> because I feel like we still need to come up with a bit of a, a format and kind of a style. Um, but I like the idea of aiming for a click and clack or, or just click right here. Here's click. <laughs> I, think, um, I think I need the clack. But some kind of a fun way to encapsulate the, the notion of what we're doing um, and give it its own identity. So any feedback you have offline um, outside of this chat since it'll disappear is very welcome. Um, you, I think we'd definitely like to know what you like about the, the past hour that you spent with us, uh, what we should do more of, um, or ways to break up the hour so that it's got a little bit more variety po possibly or not. Um, do we have to cater to that kind of a notion or not? Um, so that's where we are right now. And, and Sam, I hope you're having a good time in Costa Rica. Uh, Damn. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can turn your microphones on if you want to chat. Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Yes. And Jennifer, we could have you on too. Like I was saying, because our neighbors were um, getting their hedges trimmed. So that's <laughs> end of chaos. I have not heard you that before, but um, yeah. Well, please do. Let us, let you know, what'd you like? <laughs> let us Remember back in the day when we used to do the mentoring phone calls, Karen, yeah. and those were really helpful. I really like the idea of taking a question or a conundrum, Caribbean versus Caribbean, as like a jumping off point. Yeah. Um, we, I think. Do you think we we should return? You know, add that to our webcast um, calendar, and bring that back in, so we have this kind of a free form dialogue. Mm -hmm. where I get to really show off uh, the wonderful Robin Barr um, because this to me is super fun but I don't want to lose if if that's been important is to have a chance for people just to keep asking very sort of technical questions about I, I, I want the questions I want people to ask questions yeah. I want you know which is it why, why do I say Caribbean or Caribbean why is yeah. it recluse or recluse that's I mean that is interesting it's important if you're trying to tell your students okay where does this word go yeah because you need mm -hmm. to syllable is well maybe we'll try to promote and, and have a bit more of a formal q a at um say the first five minutes and then um that gets us started these are the questions we've got in the past week oh yeah um, some of these themes right yeah one of the questions i got in the past week was uh is english a pigeon or not discuss <laughs> or is creole. it a creole, is it english a creole? A creole? yeah, yeah. So these are some, what I find is there's so, already there's so much we could talk about that's really quite deep and heady yeah. and fun um, that it kind of deserves its own space so we don't feel like we're ignoring the, the, more, the more kind of um, practical questions about what color is this best described as. Yeah. Um, in, in a sense, I think I want to, I would consider creating a space for the what questions versus the why question. Mm -hmm. like why is Caribbean and Caribbean, why, why does that happen? Yes. No, I can I can talk out forever about that because why is what I do. What? Well, you decide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, so we may have that. That would be a good option. Any thoughts on that? I like the idea of using a question as a jumping off point. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, and especially like the the problems that people are having in their classes. Is probably a good idea. Yeah. Well, then maybe I'll schedule a, a webcast that is about a week before this one so we can do the what kinds of questions or, mm -hmm. or say classroom questions and then save the, the nuggets that really deserve some elaboration and yeah. bring them back again. So that, that could work. Yeah, because uh, if you know why something is happening, then you're not stuck in the, um, what's the right answer? In the box of what's the yeah. right answer. Yeah. Now, I think that's what people get caught up in is, is that whole word teachers, culturally speaking, we're supposed to be prescriptive. And so much of what we do isn't, it's communication, it's not prescriptive. And so when you talk about, you know, being intelligible to other people, um, so I think that's really important, just creating a space where you can explain, it doesn't have to be this way and it doesn't have to be that way. I think that that thread is really the key, um, in my opinion. And saying that something is close enough, yeah, intelligible, and it doesn't have to copy my pronunciation exactly. Okay. However, your pronunciation right now is not close enough, even though it sounds to you like it's close enough. It's not close enough. So, what is the, what is the allowable range of variation among yeah. all the different dialects versus uh, between our dialect and, and the learner's dialect, where you won't be able to under, be understood if you go if you stray the border. No, I didn't say too. No, loving this. He was really into it. He wanted to hold, hold the phone, walk around, and just he was giggling and laughing. He was he was all about it. Wonderful. Well, hey, thanks for joining us, and Jennifer, you too. I, I see you're you're still here in the room, and uh, <laughs> we'll be <laughs> we'll be doing this again. We um, my goal is to get better at emphasizing this in advance, but we'll be putting up the calendar pretty soon here. So you can see when we're getting together. Okay. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Um, my my son's girlfriend is arriving for the first time, so I'm cleaning and listening at the same time. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, have, and how old is your son? Twenty-one. Oh. 
better know what it is. Yeah, this is great. This is great. <laughs> so, you know, it's the college girlfriend. We've only met a few times, so. Wonderful. Well, have a good time with that. that. Thank you. See you both soon. Take care. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.